have a child with a disability, there are so many things you have to learn. It's a steep learning curve, and just about the time you feel like you finally got a handle on everything, your child's about to turn 18 and the whole world changes. The idea of transition to adulthood can feel really overwhelming. There are a lot of moving parts and a lot of different programs and agencies that you suddenly have to work with, but you're not alone. So let's talk about some of the bigger steps involved in transitioning to adulthood. Some of the more formal transition processes start at age 14. Things like the transition IEP in school or the pre-employment transition services or pre ETS program. The thing is, it's never too early to start thinking about transitioning to adulthood. Often when we start thinking about it, we look at the services and supports that are already available and we base our options and we base our decisions based on those available resources. We adjust our thoughts, we adjust our dreams and our plans to fit what already exists. But we should actually be doing the opposite. We should start with what our dream is and what our child's dream is for a good life and figure out how to achieve that good life. One of the best ways to do that is to use the life course framework. They have a lot of tools available to help in that understanding of transition to adulthood. And in fact, they've even got an entire section just on transition to adulthood. They can help you think about what options are available and help you think a little bit outside of the box to help you achieve that vision of a good life for your loved one. And once you've identified some of what constitutes that good life, well, where do you go from there? Well, look at the individual strengths and interests. Look at education, look at employment, look at community resources, because you can always take those tools from the life course framework and all the work that you've done, and you can always update them, you can expand them, and you can change them as your vision of a good life changes. So let's start with education though, because that's really the first time most people start thinking about transition to adulthood. And they do that because special education laws say that schools have to start that transition process for the school year in which the child turns 14. I know, that's a little bit wordy, but that's how the law is written. And so let's talk about what options are still available in high school. First of all, a student can stay in school until the school year in which the student turns 22. This allows the student to draw out classes to take advantage of the opportunities, services, and supports that are already available in school. Also look into vocational schools. These are part of high school, which means all of the services and supports available to a student through their IEP are still in play. A student can explore different careers and train for work while getting the supports their IEP provides. Students as young as 14 can also be part of the Pre-Employment Transition Services Program, or Pre-ETS. This is a program through Vocational Rehabilitation Services, but it's provided in cooperation with schools, but it's not a school-based program. That's important because since it is not a school-based program, it is not limited to the school calendar or school resources but it provides meaningful career planning to help in that transition from high school to employment or post-secondary training. pre ETS is available to students with disabilities who are either eligible or potentially eligible for VR services. That means any student with an IEP or a student with a 504 plan may be able to take part in the pre ETS program. To learn more about pre ETS programs, contact your school's transition coordinator to connect you with the pre ETS provider in your area but some students with disabilities want to go on to college, and there are certain resources that can help with that. The Indiana Institute on Disability and Community has a publication called, Is College for You? Setting Goals and Taking Action. That's a resource available to help walk you through all the different issues involved to decide if college is the right choice for you. It's also important to choose the right school when you're looking at college or any other post-secondary education opportunity. Websites like thinkcollege.net have resources to help you think about all the different issues involved with attending college, but you should also go on college visits. Talk to the Office of Disabled Student Services in advance at each college. They're gonna be called something a little bit differently depending on which campus you're on, but it's a great way to find out what types of services and supports a college campus may already have available for students with disabilities. Trade schools are another great option when it comes to post-secondary education. It's definitely more hands-on learning and the classes are directly related to the subject matter. Often with trade schools, you can get professional certifications or it can lead to licensure. 
The Department of Workforce Development, often called the Work One Office, and Vocational Rehabilitation Services may be able to connect individuals and help them get the accommodations they need for trade schools. Talk to your school counselor for more options. Vocational Rehabilitation Services and Work One are both state agencies tasked with helping individuals find community-based competitive wage jobs. Both agencies can help with high school equivalencies, post-secondary training programs, and college. They can help provide accommodations, supports, and information on financing. Both agencies can also arrange for job shadowing if a person's looking more for direct employment and not so much post-secondary education. The Department of Workforce Development has all sorts of programs that can be helpful too. They have adult learning centers, so if someone only got a certificate of completion in high school, or maybe they just dropped out, they help fund programs so that a person can get their high school equivalency. They also offer apprenticeships through their Work and Learn through DWD program. They have a search engine called In Training to help find training programs and cost information on their website. And they also have something called Win Career Readiness Tools, which are free online tools through the Department of Workforce Development to build relevant job skills. Finally, when a person turns 18, they must have a Social Security Disability Determination in order to keep their Medicaid benefits. Social Security Determination is based on a review of medical records and other documents, including but not limited to IEPs, evaluations, and vocational records. When Social Security is making their disability determination for an adult, they are looking exclusively at the impact of the person's impairment on their ability to work. If you haven't already applied for a Medicaid waiver, this is a good time to do that. Medicaid waivers are what Indiana calls their home and community-based services that allow an individual to access services to live as independently as possible in their own communities. In order to receive a waiver, an individual must be eligible for an appropriate Medicaid health plan category, and they must meet an appropriate level of care. Now, waivers through the Bureau of Developmental Disability Services are designed to help people with developmental disabilities get out and be as active in the community as possible. Their services are designed to be person-centered, individualized, and help people learn independent living skills, supplement their needs, and work toward that person's vision of a good life. If you live in an area of the state that's covered by a Center for Independent Living, it's also a great time to reach out to them. The Centers for Independent Living are agencies around the state to help individuals with any type of disability live as independently as possible. And they can do that in a lot of different ways. First of all, they can help teach someone independent living skills, such as budgeting, housekeeping, and navigating transportation. They can also help connect you with other programs like utility assistance, transportation, home modifications, assistive technology, and even housing options. Now, not every part of the state is covered by a Center for Independent Living, but they are available as a resource. They are free to use. The only catch is the person with a disability has to be the one to reach out and request help. This is also the time we need to think about types of legal and formal supports. One of the things that we want to do, and we want to do it as early as possible, is use a supported decision-making model to help people with disabilities learn how to make decisions. We also want to make sure that we're using supported decision-making so that people with disabilities are able to have as much self-determination as possible. Many families believe that they must get guardianship when an individual with a disability turns 18. That's not necessarily the case. There are a variety of support options. Start by determining what level of support a person may need and use that integrated supported decision-making model into the support options you choose. I keep talking about supported decision-making, but not everyone's familiar with what exactly that means and it sounds so formal, but frankly, supported decision-making is something that we all use in our own lives anyway. Supported decision-making is going to family, friends, and experts for advice or guidance on making a decision in order to build a team of supports of the person's choosing so that they can go to when there are issues or problems that arise, or frankly, even for day-to-day -day advice. It's a way to gather information and learn how to evaluate all of their options and review as many options as desired and still maintain the right to make the final decision. Just keep in mind that supported decision-making can be used as a support, as an alternative, or even in conjunction with guardianship. And believe it or not, this is a time to register to vote. 
first of all, it's important to know that even individuals under guardianship still maintain the right to vote. Now, you can also vote in a primary at the age of 17 if the individual will be 18 in time for the general election. In order to vote, you must be a U.S. citizen and you must live in the precinct you plan to vote in for a minimum of 30 days prior to the election. You must register to vote and you must have a government issued ID card. There are a lot of different issues involved with transitioning to adulthood and we just touched on a few of the really important ones. If you have questions, by all means, talk with one of the family advocates at the Ark of Indiana. We can talk about your specific situation, answer your specific questions, and try to help you through this process. For more information on this and other topics, visit the Ark of Indiana at arcind.org and the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration at in.gov FSSA. For information on charting the life course, and on how Life Course tools can help individuals and families develop a vision for a good life and identify how to find or develop supports, visit lifecoursetools.com. And please, don't hesitate to contact a family advocate at the Ark of Indiana by calling 317-977-2375 or 800-382-9100.